The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. He's the king of breakfast TV and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise. with me this Even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Oh, you have holy water by your bed? Oh yes, oh, already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6am. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Five national missions from the Labour Party. But are they any different from the Prime Minister's own five pledges? That and a new report shows the dire state of the NHS in Scotland and the dire state of the SNP's plan to make it better. We'll explore all of that after the headlines. Good morning, it's coming up to 9.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. In an exclusive interview, the Home Secretary has told GB News nothing is ruled out when it comes to tackling illegal immigration. More than 45,000 people crossed the channel in small boats last year, which Suella Braverman describes as unacceptable, adding there needs to be a deterrent. Speaking to Liam Halligan, she also said she understands why people are frustrated with hotels housing asylum seekers. It's clear that we have an unsustainable situation in towns and cities around our country, whereby, because of the overwhelming numbers of people arriving here illegally and our legal duties to accommodate them, we are now having to uh, house them in hotels. And that is causing understandable tensions within communities, pressures on local resources. And you can watch the full 22-minute interview with the Home Secretary, Swella Braverman, on the GB News YouTube channel. An attempted murder investigation has been launched after a senior police officer was shot in front of children in County Tyrone. Named as Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell, he was hit multiple times when two masked men opened fire at a sports centre in Omar. 
He's in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Police investigating the attack say they're focusing on dissident Republican group, the new IRA. Former MP for Thumman and South Tyrone, Tom Elliott, says the community is understandably shocked. We thought we were living in a very peaceful time. We thought that uh, we had passed this, and, and I remember you know, talking about this several times whenever uh, the troubles were here, but we didn't think at this stage that we would be back to a society like this where people came and uh, shot someone in front of young kids and, and, and attempted murder. And, you know, it's so brutal. It was planned, targeted, premeditated. In the US, a reporter and a nine-year-old girl have been fatally shot. Police say a second reporter and the girl's mother were also injured by the gunman. A 19-year-old suspect named as Keith Moses has been arrested. Police in Florida say the shooting happened close to the scene of a separate murder that took place earlier that day. The two journalists had been covering the incident, but police say it's unclear why they were targeted. And the Disasters Emergency Committee has raised nearly £100 million following the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. The non-government organisation, which brings together 15 UK charities, says it's one of the fastest and largest appeals launched. More than 48,000 people were killed and over 800,000 have been displaced by the quakes. The money will be used to provide food, water, shelter and warm clothing for those impacted. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Tom. Good morning, it's 9.34 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, this morning, official numbers are being published revealing the scale of illegal migration to the United Kingdom. And this news comes as the Home Secretary has exclusively told GB News that nothing is ruled out when it comes to fixing the Channel migrant crisis. In an exclusive interview with GB News's Liam Halligan, she also issued a veiled threat to number 10 over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Talking of the law, Home Secretary, over 45,000 people crossed the channel in small boats last year. The number this year is expected to be a lot higher. Rishi Sunak, in his own words, is committed to passing new laws to stop the small boats. Those laws have now been laid before Parliament. Does that mean that the government's ruled out leaving the European Convention on Human Rights in order to try and tackle this vexed problem? Well, I think that there are legitimate questions that we need to start asking relating to our membership of the European Convention of Human Rights and its operation in the United Kingdom. We've seen there's a politicised and expansionist court in Strasbourg that regulates the convention, sometimes at odds with British values, whether it's our ability to remove people to Rwanda, as we saw last year. Its operation, combined with the ECHR, and the court have operated to stymie policy making. You make, you make a strong legal case with respect to Home Secretary, but the optics of leaving the ECHR are, are difficult. You've got the stomach to leave it, clearly, has the Prime Minister. At this stage, nothing's ruled out. We need to ensure that we fix this problem of illegal migration. That's my priority. And as the Prime Minister himself has said, he'll do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. In light of those uh, small boat incidents, we've seen protests now around the country increasingly in Liverpool, in, in Rotherham, protests planned in, in Newquay. Some have said that those protesters are far right. Is that a fair characterisation of those protesters? Well, what I would say firstly is that violence is never acceptable and intimidation, harassment, uh, any forms of abuse to anybody uh, are totally, uh, should be condemned and I condemn them in the fullest possible terms. And it's clear that we have an unsustainable situation in towns and cities around our country whereby because of the overwhelming numbers of people arriving here illegally and our legal duties to accommodate them, we are now having to uh, house them in hotels. We are all frustrated with the situation that we are currently finding ourselves in and, uh, and you know, it, is, it is clear and undeniable that there are 
uh, really, really serious pressures on communities and saying so does not make you racist or bigoted. Simon Clark, former cabinet minister, has said there will be a very real problem for the government if there is a Northern Ireland deal that doesn't carry the support of the DUP. Is he right? Listen, the DUP are uh, an important voice in this debate and in this discussion. They Vital. speak. Can we have a deal that they don't agree to? We have always worked very closely with the DUP. They are unionists. They speak for a significant portion of the communities in Northern Ireland. And they need to be uh, round the table. Ultimately, Stormont will only function if the DUP supports any proposal. You resigned, of course, as a Brexit minister in 2018 over Theresa May's deal. Would you resign over this? Listen, I don't think we need to be talking about resignation. I've taken a very forthright position in the past because I've found the terms of previous uh, agreements intolerable. Uh, I, I, I don't uh, support selling out on Northern Ireland and uh, allowing the EU a foothold in the United Kingdom. Do you like being Home Secretary? Well, I see my role as telling the truth and then fixing the problem. And sometimes the truth is uncomfortable for some people and they might get upset by hearing the truth. I'm not going to shy away from telling the truth to the British people and for the British people. That's my role as Home Secretary. Telling the truth and then fixing the problem. Well, we can hear more of Liam Halligan's full 22-minute interview with the Home Secretary now on the GB News YouTube channel. Well, let's get more on exactly what uh, the Home Secretary was saying in that full interview and indeed the implications of it. I'm delighted to be joined by Liam Halligan in the studio. And, and Liam, uh, what did you make of her answers there, particularly on that thorny issue of resignation? She seemed to sort of dance around the head of a pin. Yeah, but she is the Home Secretary and this is the key issue in the Prime Minister's in-tray at the moment. It dominated Parliament, Prime Minister's questions yesterday, Tom, as you know, with a very powerful intervention by Geoffrey Donaldson of the DUP and much mocking from Keir Starmer. So for her to even sit down with me in her in office for a 20-minute interview mm. and talk about Northern Ireland is pretty punchy. And in the full interview, you can uh, listen to her issuing a veiled threat. She said there in that, in that clip that she's resigned before when she's found the terms of conditions intolerable. In the full interview, she says, look, Stormont won't work if we don't have the DUP. Mm. It's as simple as that. I don't think she approaches Northern Ireland because she has any great, you know, long-standing history in Northern Ireland or deep, deep uh, interest in the very complex politics of Northern Ireland, mm. with all respect to her. She approaches it as a lawyer and she mm. is legally offended, she is constitutionally offended that what she calls, in a phrase that's likely to stick, a politicised and expansionist court in Strasbourg, of course, mm. the European Court of Justice, which is a political court, if any one objective uh, is to analyse it. Mm. She, she doesn't like the fact, and lots of other people don't like the fact, that the ECJ holds sway in Northern mm. Ireland, even after Brexit, and people in Northern Ireland have no jurisdiction at all over those ECJ rules because we're not in the European Union. It's a completely mm. weird situation. It has some benefits, it has drawbacks, and Suella Braverman is definitely highlighting the drawbacks. And many, many, many MPs, Tom, as you know, on the Tory backbenches are looking to her. If she can't stomach this deal that Rishi Sunak has apparently made mm. but not yet unveiled, then and, and she resigns, then the Sunak government is in emergency measures. It's a really profound situation mm. and of course uh, Suella Bravman is someone who has uh, in the past resigned uh, and indeed has voted against Theresa May's deal three she, times. She she's, is the the only, she's the only so-called Spartan who's still in government. She's not just in mm. government, she's the Home Secretary mm. and Sunak knows he needs her there as Home Secretary to frankly control the right and parts of the centre-right mm. of his party. Well, Without her there, those ERG uh, backbenchers, who are so numerous they could easily take out Sunak's majority at a stroke, they will not behave if she's gone. 
Well, let's broaden this conversation out now because we're also joined by James Heal, the diary editor of The Spectator. And, and James, uh, how much trouble is Rishi Sunak in? Because on this issue, it seemed like he thought everything was going to be yeah. sewn up last week. He wanted to present a deal and it all to go very smoothly this week. It hasn't quite panned out. No, and I was talking to one member of the ERG uh, yesterday who was saying how amazed they were that number 10 let him get so exposed in this. It was really all the kind of mood music. Last Saturday, Sunday, was very hopeful about it deal and suddenly actually turns out they didn't have the numbers. What I'm detecting, and there have been some reports about this as well, is that also Tory MPs on the left of the party, uh, similar numbers, around 50 or so, are also getting impatient now and saying, we want to push for a deal, you should ignore the ERG. And that's a very difficult task for Rishi Sunak to face about which of these kind of various uh, strands of the party he wants to play off. Is there a risk he becomes a sort of Theresa May-like figure? I was speaking to someone who was very high up in the May administration last night who was saying he could see Sunak making some of those same mistakes that Theresa May made. Yes, and I think that Rishi Sunak, for instance, you see his personal demeanour from you know, talking to MPs who speak to him when he comes to address them. They, you know, they appreciate he's a very intelligent man. They think that he's you know, a good communicator. But I think when you don't accept his arguments and you keep you know, you know, interrogating him, he gets a little bit prickly. And I think we've seen a touch of that in the press conferences. And that, I think, man, man kind of rubs it up the wrong way sometimes. So I think there's a danger, perhaps, that he's seen as a bit patronising, belittling of them. And actually, of course, we talk about a Tory majority of 70, as we all know, mm. 35 is actually the real number, because you get to 35, 40 MPs, it's game over. Really, really interesting stuff. Now, of course, Rishi Sunak has made one of his key five pledges to deal with the boats, stop the boats, new laws to stop the boats. And, and, and Liam, what did the Home Secretary tell you about how far those laws are coming along? Because there are a lot of impatient Conservative backbenchers. Well, a lot of the interviews, you can imagine, was about uh, small boats. Incidentally, on Rishi Sunak, uh, a, a current cabinet minister high up told me a couple of days ago that in the view of that cabinet minister, uh, the prime minister has what that cabinet minister calls a glass jaw. Mm. He doesn't like combative conversations. Mm. He doesn't like people contradicting him. And, you know, this is when character comes to the fore, when you're under serious pressure. How do you respond to the very uh, strongly put demands of competing parts of your party? Mm. On small boats, of course, as a lawyer, Suella Braveman, uh, just as on the Northern Ireland Protocol, she wants that Northern Ireland Protocol bill to go through the Lords. She doesn't want Number mm. 10 to abandon it. So the UK's got somewhere to go, a, a negotiating tool. She's called that bill a tool. And mm. similarly, on small boats, she wants the UK to keep the pretty difficult option, the lots of bad political optics of leaving the European Convention of Human mm. Rights, a, a legal tract that was drafted by British lawyers, British parliamentarians in the shadow of the Second World War, very much a response to the mm. grotesque humanitarian catastrophe but, of the but Holocaust. many people have seen has, has sort of gone beyond its but original she, intent. But, absolutely. In, in the full interview, there's a very, very um, detailed um, uh, treatment by Swella Braveman of what the ECHR does now that it shouldn't be doing, mm. and we have to consider removing Britain from the ECHR. So, again, the Home Office is about to lay legislation before Parliament, as you guys know, to deal with small boats that mm. doesn't involve leaving the ECHR. But, you know, that's going to go to the Lords. The Lords are going to biff it back, that earning clad sort of chamber of legal aid and remain, frankly. And so she wants that option of leaving the ECHR still on the table. Mm. She's got the stomach to leave the ECHR. It's whether or Has not... Has Rishi Sunak got the stomach to have mm. the bien pensant media class say, oh, my God, that's horrible. Has he got the stomach for that? To be a fly on a wall in those Cabinet discussions must be absolutely fascinating, because no doubt there is a spectrum of opinion around that lozenge Politics, eh? tables. Um, As but, Alex Ferguson didn't but, say. But, but we were talking about these five pledges from Sunak, and, and the boats is clearly one of them. Today, we will be hearing from Sir Keir Starmer, who has five, not pledges... <laughs> But missions, entirely different, of course. Uh, James Hill, are these any different from what Rishi Sunak's saying? Well, I hope you're excited, Tom. I like the sort of <laughs> evangelical tone to all of this. So Keir Starmer will preach the, the good word from the good book. Um, I think that all, some of the people in Labour I was talking to are trying to 
keen to downplay, you know, kind of comparisons between the two, but obviously that's inevitably how it's going to be presented. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that, uh, you know, that what he's chosen to focus on, and I think it shows a, a subtle but important shift. You know, he talks about crime, but of course, mm. if you want to put it crudely, Labour has traditionally been seen as the party of the public sector rather than the private sector. So when you talk about crime, you're talking about MOJ backlog, you're talking about public investment, you're talking about funding, and that's sort of ground on which Keir Starmer feels very capable and comfortable, rather than, say, small boats, which, incidentally, I don't believe is one of his five missions no. that we're talking about. So there's the economy, there's the NHS, Yes, there's also uh, the green agenda and the environment and clean energy. And this is, again, something where all the Labour Party, which has been divided on lots of things recently, can come together on this one key point because it's kind of seen as uh, kind of you know, environmental, popular, and they can all get behind that agenda. So I think it'll be interesting to see the kind of reaction to that. Is it going to be actually breaking new ground or is it going to merely be you know, one of the many slogans he's ditched before? And, of course, Sir Keir Starmer is speaking in Manchester today, uh, sort of, I suppose, a red wall -y kind of area. But the, the focus of his... Uh, uh, mission statement today, to coin a phrase, will be on his first point, the economy. And he's expected to say that he wants the UK to be the fastest growing G7 economy. Uh, Liam Halligan, is that possible? It's a bit of a motherhood and apple pie pledge, isn't it? I want growth. I want to be uh, ambitious. Look, we, we, we hear endlessly from journalists and pundits that the UK is the slow and grow, going to be the slowest growing economy in the G7. Uh, you will have noticed, Tom, I know you follow these things very closely, uh, the Purchasing Manager Index number on Monday, Tuesday, which is a kind of unofficial uh, predictor of GDP, it was, if 50 is growth, it was at 53, far mm. higher than almost any independent economist predicted. Look, I'm not saying there isn't a cost of living crisis. I bang on about it on this channel no. every day. A lot of companies are suffering, a lot of people are suffering, but there are some economic green shoots out there now. The OBR's forecast of the budget deficit for January was out by a huge order of magnitude. 30 billion. Uh, 30 billion so uh, across far this the 10 months from, yes. from, from April. And, and around 5 billion for the month specific. For the specific month of January. That gives Jeremy Hunt the kind of good news he doesn't want to hear because mm. it gives him fiscal headroom, and the public sector unions are then going to say, oh, you can give some of that money to us. Mm. And the Tories on the back bench is going to say, Say, oh, you can now not raise corporation tax. Uh, <laughs> so there is a lot more fiscal headroom mm. at the moment than these, frankly, ridiculously, consistently gloomy forecasts from the OBR. Mm. The IMF, you know, they've got one of the worst forecasting records in human history. I speak as somebody who used to work there. Yeah. So there is actually a little bit more fiscal headroom. There are green shoots. I'm not complacent on the economy at all. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's pretty clear to me that Keir Starmer is being disciplined. He doesn't want to say anything that isn't fiscally costed. That's why he's just biffed back the idea of Sadiq Khan, met Labour Mayor Sadiq Khan's idea for free school meals yeah. for everybody. Really, really interesting stuff. We'll be following what Sir Keir Starmer says more throughout the day. Of course, he's speaking in Manchester a little bit later on. But for now, Liam Halligan and James Heal, thank you very much for joining me. Just to update uh, you now, the number of asylum seekers waiting for that initial decision, that number has just been released today. Uh, it's topped 160,000 for the first time since current records began in 2010. Those numbers are from the Home Office. Now, uh, Sir Keir Starmer may or may not be addressing that in his speech a little later today. But moving on. Audit Scotland has today published a scathing report into the Scottish Government's £1.26 billion NHS recovery plan. The plan is described by the auditors as, quote, a high-level, top-down document that does not contain the detailed actions that would allow overall progress to be accurately measured. And this matters. This is the plan of the now undisputed frontrunner to become the next First Minister of Scotland, Health Minister Humza Youssef, who's been criticised this winter for urging the public to, quote, think twice before calling 999. But this morning's new independent auditor's report takes criticism to a whole new level. Here's a little flavour of what's inside. Quote, the NHS in Scotland faces significant growing financial pressures. Quote, a growing capital maintenance backlog. Quote, more people are being added to waiting lists than are being removed from them, and people are waiting longer for treatment. And delays in getting social care support for patients who are ready to leave hospital continue to limit the availability of beds. Now, the auditor criticises Humza Youssef's department's GP recruitment numbers as, quote, misleading, 
warning that the Scottish Government is now failing its ambition to recruit an extra 800 GPs. Indeed, it notes Public Health Scotland's report that far from expanding, GP working time equivalent actually decreased. It decreased by over 26% between 2017 and 2022. That's the wrong direction. And a key element of the Yusuf Recovery Plan was the National Treatment Centre programme, new purpose-built centres for planned and diagnostic care. But the auditors today have said that delays to the National Treatment Centre programme mean targets for increased activity are unlikely to be met. Three centres that were due to open last year in NHS Fife, NHS Fourth Valley and NHS Highland, they've all been delayed. And the auditors now say that some national treatment centres are unlikely to open until late 2027 or 2028. So that's treatment centre delays, GP target failings and growing waiting lists, all in a plan that fails to deliver measurable details. And that's according to Audit Scotland. Now, the Auditor General, Stephen Boyle, says that ministers have to prioritise which NHS aims can realistically be delivered, and they need to be more transparent about the progress they're making. It's not a good look for the First Minister frontrunner. But of course, it's not just Humza Youssef who has been under pressure this week. Perhaps more publicly, Kate Forbes, the current Treasury Minister for the SNP and indeed a runner in this race, has faced uh, numerous backers withdrawing their support for her campaign after she said that she would have voted against gay marriage. Uh, back if she had been an SNP MP in 2014. Uh, now, let's get more on this uh, scandal that's been brewing this week with William Atkinson, the assistant editor at Conservative Home. Uh, uh, and William, is it surprising that suddenly people have been withdrawing support from Kate Forbes? Did they not know about her evangelical Christian views when she announced? Well, yes, uh, she's been an MSP since 2016. Um, so it is rather shocking that um, her fellow MSPs have only just discovered and um, that she actually believes in the word of the Bible. Um, I would say that it's perhaps a bit of a sort of concocted row in the sense that um, polling has suggested that the uh, views of a lot of SNP members um, are relatively socially conservative, indeed, um, just behind the Conservatives when it comes to uh, major parties. But I think the more important thing is that it's shown that uh, Kate Forbes, who is only 32 and has been on... Uh, um, maternity leave for most of the last year, is relatively politically inexperienced. Um, she reminds me of uh, Rishi Sunak last year when confronted about his wife's tax affairs. She should have known that these questions were going to um, come. We've seen a similar experience with Tim Farron a few years ago when he was continually asked about gay sex during the 2017 general election. And she should have had some sort of media strategy ready. The fact that she has been confronted by these questions, answered them honestly, and then not known how to uh, handle the controversy that it's caused, uh, means that she has gone from being the bookie's favourite um, to being an almost no-hoper in the space of about a day, uh, which even in this uh, age of Liz Truss and the like seems relatively quick. Uh, it certainly does, but are we being too critical here? Should we really be wanting our politicians to come up with non-answers to questions, to have these sort of media strategies? Isn't it to some extent refreshing, even if it was somewhat kamikaze, uh, for Kate Forbes to actually say what she thinks? Well, yes, I mean, in a country where now um, fewer than half of us describe ourselves um, as Christian, you know, down about 30% in the last two decades, it is refreshing to have somebody of faith in public life who's willing to be honest about it. But I think she also needs to understand the political environments in which she um, exists. She's not necessarily a victim of aggressive secularism, but just her own uh, lack of skill at sort of political discourse. And I think um, something that's uh, also important to note about um, Kate Forbes, is that she has managed to get through the first seven years of her political career uh, without this being an issue. And Hamza Youssef, who you just mentioned, um, despite himself um, being a Muslim, uh, has said that he uh, sort of beds down his own uh, religious views when coming to vote in legislation like this for the broader good of the SNP. So I guess what party members, or indeed just her SNPs, want for her is to uh, render unto the SNP what is the SNP's 
uh, and render unto God what is God, uh, to misquote. Uh, I can't remember which book of the Bible it is, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, really, really interesting stuff there. It looks like Humza Yusuf is now the clear front runner. It's his for the losing, despite the many scandals he himself has presided over. William Atkinson, thank you so much for joining us to talk through uh, a, an interesting race <laughs> north of the border. Uh, that's it for us today. Coming up next, it's Bev Turner today. Join me again at 9.30 tomorrow. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hostile...